Welcome everybody to this Knaka event on what is a climate assembly. Um, if you don't know it already, Knaka is a European network for sharing best practice on the design and implementation of climate assemblies. And one of the ways that we're doing this is to organize different events where network members can learn about and discuss past and future climate assemblies or key climate assembly features of particular interest to the members. Um, this learning event is intended to be a basic introduction to the key features of a climate assembly for people with little or no prior knowledge and to discuss the reasons for running a climate assembly and then of course to answer any questions that you might have. My name is Frederik Lanke and I work at the Danish Board of Technology um, who've designed and facilitated the Danish Climate Assembly. And I'm a part of the Knaka Management Committee and work in the field of deliberative democracy. First, I will uh, go through the key features of a climate assembly and some of the reasons for running it. Then you will hear um, from Kelly McBride and Kayla Scott who we've been invited to share some of their insights from their work with climate assemblies. Uh, and after this, we uh, three will try to answer any questions that you might have. Um, we all work as practitioners, meaning that it's part of our job to design and implement citizen participation processes. And uh, after that, we will go after we've heard from Kelly and Kayla, we will go into a Q&A session uh, where you could, so please put all your questions in the chat and my colleague Jane will help facilitate this session. So let's begin. What is a climate assembly? A climate assembly is a process that brings together randomly selected everyday people to learn, to deliberate, and to make recommendations for how to deal with climate change. It is, it is typically initiated and commissioned by public authorities, but can also be so by civil society organizations. In Knaka, we have so far chosen to focus our attention on national assemblies, but they can also be local or even global. From a practical point of view, this is a typical way of breaking up the key features of a climate assembly in a before, a during, and an after its actual implementation. I'll go through these features now, but one key takeaway here is that a lot of work involved in organizing a climate assembly takes place before its actual practical implementation. This may seem like a trivial point, but it's really important to stress that a lot of time and attention should be given to this phase if the climate assembly is to be successful. So first, a few words about the sorry, framing. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, the the slideshow didn't start yet. We are we are still at the first page. Okay. Um, I'll try to stop. Uh, the sharing, or I'll see if I can share the right one. Maybe this one. Is it better now? Does it work? Perfect. Thank you for noticing. Yeah, Don't perfect. Tell. Thank you. All right. But let's dive into the tasks for the climate assemblies. Um, first of all, it's important that they are clear and understandable. Here you see a few examples from climate assemblies around the world around Europe. And what they have in common is that the framing is rather broad, although there are nuances. The important thing is that the task should enable and empower citizens to give recommendations that policymakers are likely to find useful. They're more likely to do so if they can feed into ongoing political discussions and negotiations and or have the opportunity to initiate new ones. It's an ongoing discussion among researchers and practitioners if it's better to frame the task more broadly or more narrowly. A broad framing gives citizens a better opportunity to set the agenda, but a bigger risk of not delivering sufficiently 
targeted input to ongoing political negotiations and discussions. What causes the most heated debate is the political commitment to adopt or respond to citizens' recommendations. Some argue that politicians should promise in advance to turn citizens' recommendations into legislation. Others argue that this would be undemocratic thing to do and that politicians should simply promise to take the recommendations into consideration, whatever that means. There are several things politicians could promise to do in advance, such as debating recommendations with citizens and in parliament, consider holding referendums on select recommendations, and giving written response to all recommendations, for example. This is arguably one of the most difficult features of a climate assembly to deal with, and it's recommendable to spend a lot of time on discussing this with politicians before proceeding with an assembly. A clear and detailed description of the political commitment will increase the citizens' motivations and help aligning expe expectations from different societal actors that have different opinions on how big the promises should be. In practice, this discussion will continue during the implementation, and it's helpful to think in advance about ways in which it could be facilitated. Here you see some of the people and governance bodies typically involved in a climate assembly. It's normal to have a steering group, which could include both the commissioners of the assembly, the secretariat, delivery team and representatives from different stakeholder organizations. It's also normal to have an advisory board with experts in climate and citizen participation that can help identify expert panels that will inform citizens' deliberations. Also, one can expect a high level of interest from especially researchers and possibly other kinds of observers. A key question is the role of the secretariat and delivery team in charge of the practical organization of the assembly. Some will argue that the organization of a climate assembly should be handled almost exclusively by independent citizen participation professionals that operate at arm's length from the public authority, commissioning the assembly to ensure democratic legitimacy. Others will argue in favor of having public officials at the center of the practical organization of the assembly because they're closer to the political process, which will increase the chances of political impact. I think it's safe to say that no matter how the governance structure is set up, citizen participation professionals should have a key role. Also, the governance structure should be transparent and democratic legitimacy should be secured by sufficient checks and balances preventing a politically biased process. One final design feature, which I will only mention briefly, is the communication strategy. There's no doubt that a good communication strategy will result in more political attention to the process and thus increase the chances of achieving a political impact. So let's take a closer look at the practical implementation of a climate assembly, starting with the citizen recruitment. A climate assembly typically includes 100 or more citizens that are randomly selected and reflect the social demographic diversity in their country. Most often, a large number of invitations are sent out, 5, 10, or maybe even 15 thousands, to randomly selected addresses or via randomly selected phone numbers depending on the available options in a given country. Out of those, maybe 500 or 1,000 will accept the invitation. And out of those, you then choose a sample that match the statistical distribution in your country of age, gender, occupation, education, and geographical zone of residency. Um, those are at least some of the typical uh, variables. And when you have your citizens, it's time to get started. So here you have two examples, one from Denmark and one from France, of how an, an assembly, meeting, uh, assembly meeting flow can be structured. 
The Danish example is from the first phase of the climate assembly, which took place entirely online, just like the Scottish one. And it was a combination of weekend plenaries, thematic evening plenaries, and smaller theme group evening meetings. The French assembly was originally structured as a series of seven face-to-face -face meetings, weekend plenaries, but was added one online weekend. And the three main components of assembly meetings are learning, deliberation, and decision making. The learning is typically structured as presentations by different resource persons, such as scientists and stakeholders, panel debates between resource persons, and Q&A sessions between them and citizens. In Denmark, written information material was also sent to citizens in advance. Information about climate change challenges in different sectors and an overview of potential solutions under consideration by different societal actors. Learning input from resource persons will typically take place throughout the entire process. And if well-structured, a climate assembly will move from top-down curated knowledge input chosen by the organizers towards knowledge input requested by citizens themselves. Then the third part, deliberation, typically takes place in smaller groups of citizens where draft recommendations are produced. And decision-making takes place, for example, when citizens choose and frame the themes they would like to work with and when they decide on and rank recommendations at the end of the process. Here, I just want to show you an example of the program for the opening day of the Danish Climate Assembly. And here are some examples of different themes that recommendation from the Danish Citizen Assembly dealt with. Um, again, this is from the first phase. And one concrete example of a recommendation on the right side of the screen. All the recommendations were structured in the same way. First, one of several related observation, um, that is facts that, were, uh, that the citizens wanted to react to. Then a more detailed assessment of those observations. So what, is, uh, what was their assessment of different ways of explaining and reacting to those observations? And finally, the citizens gave their recommendation uh, that this observation and assessment uh, prompted them to give. So when structured in this way, policymakers are provided with the rational, rationality and considerations behind citizens' recommendations. We now come to the final key features I went through the design and the implementation. I'll not say much about the evaluation besides the fact that traditionally a lot of evaluation designs for citizen participation processes such as climate assemblies has focused too much on the implementation features and too little on the design features and follow up and impact. For the same reason, we're currently working on the development of an evaluation framework within KNACA. I won't say much about the political response either. Um, this is, of course, highly dependent on the political promises defined in the design phase, but we also must acknowledge that many politicians feel uneasy about making such promises up front. One exception is, of course, Macron who promised to adopt all the citizens' recommendations, a promise he couldn't keep. But if probably informed and engaged throughout the assembly processes, and after having seen the recommendations, politicians might well be more open to respond in different ways to citizens' recommendations. And here you see a couple of concrete examples of these political responses in Ireland, France, and Denmark. So let me finish with a list of reasons for running a climate assembly. First one is to bring the informed views of the public into climate policy making. So experts and stakeholders already have more or less well-defined roles, but we lack mechanisms for bringing in informed views of lay citizens, not just opinion polls, into climate policy making. Climate assemblies is one way of doing this then they can break political deadlock on climate action. Climate assemblies can produce new and pragmatic solutions 
uh, and agenda setting. And they can provide sometimes surprising insights into how everyday citizens prioritize climate action. To increase the legitimacy of social action on climate change, this could be action taken both by policymakers and other societal actors. Then climate, act, uh, climate assemblies could be used to reduce the impact of lobbyists and special interests on climate assembly, uh, on climate policy, of course. A climate assembly helps bringing out in the open the different positions of lobby groups and it offers a platform on which they can be openly compared and discussed. Then they can be used to increase trust in representative democratic institutions. Proponents of deliberative democracy will argue that it's not enough for citizens anymore to vote every four or five years and then leaving all decisions to those elected in the meantime. Opening up policy making processes to citizens' input. Uh, they will argue, will help build trust in these institutions. Then the second to last is to fulfill a commitment to citizen participation on climate assembly, or on climate action, of course. A climate assembly is one way of ticking the box of and fulfilling political demands and expectations for more citizen participation. There are others, of course, but we will not be talking about them today. And then the last thing is to increase mutual understanding among citizens and counter polarization the level of knowledge among citizens and the level of political engagement and ownership among citizens so following this presentation i'd like now like to give the floor to the two guests that we've invited to share some of their insights uh, from their work with climate assemblies and first uh, we have Kelly McBride, who is the Deliberative Democracy Lead at TPX Impact, formerly FutureGov. She designs and facilitates community engagement, participatory and deliberative processes. She also supports governments and organizations to deliver on, deliver on commitments and reimagine governance. And she was involved in the, the delivery of Scotland's Climate Assembly and is currently exploring routine use of participatory processes and facilitating engagement of communities in local climate project planning, among other things. And then we also have with us Kayla Scott, who is the di Director of Innovation and Practice at Involve in UK. She's an experienced facilitator, public engagement practitioner and, and trainer. And she led the design and facilitation team for Scotland's Climate Assembly led involves work on the Devon Climate Assembly and was involved in the delivery of Climate Assembly UK. So a very warm welcome to Kelly and uh, Kayla. Hello. Oh, hi from Edinburgh. Uh, I understand you want us to share some reflections. I? Certainly. Yes, just go ahead. Let's start, Kelly. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as you heard there, my name is Kelly McBride. I currently work for an organisation called TPX Impact, but in a, a previous role where I worked at Democratic Society, I worked with Kayla and others on the delivery of Scotland's Climate Assembly, and I'm continuing that work in a different guise. So um, I think just listening to the presentation and giving some, some quick reflections, I think that it really highlighted uh, that there isn't necessarily one approach to designing and delivering a climate assembly that you absolutely must follow. There is the ability to adapt how you do that uh, to take into account local context and, and other things too. I think it did really well to draw out some of the different considerations and indeed in some cases tensions in relation to things including the topic and framing, the governance, the independence or not of the process, design features and facilitation. And again, there'll be lots of choices that people make uh, in different settings that will differ. And to some extent, I think uh, this is still an emerging practice, but we are now seeing an increasing number of discussions about how we do things like embed processes like climate assemblies into our way of governing and consider it alongside other ways of involving people in climate governance and move on from perhaps just one-off or ad hoc delivery. And I think, you know, a key thing when when it comes to delivering processes like this is understanding what you're trying to do and setting really clear expectations from the get-go, not least for yourselves, people involved in the process, but also um, for the participants of the process 
and of course, wider uh, society, the media and others. And there are some things that are really important to consider in that. We've already touched on this, of course, but agenda. Ordinarily, a climate assembly will have some kind of framing question. The one that we had in Scotland, for example, was how should Scotland change to tackle the climate emergency in an effective and fair way? And that was uh, something that the stewarding group of that process came together um, to develop as part of the process. But you can set questions in different ways. Whereas other processes have had perhaps slightly more focused questions on things like, you know, how can we work together to improve the water environment? How can we... Uh, ensure that air quality is improved, you know, really specific elements. And the agenda that you set, the questions that you set will really um, inform the evidence that you, you kind of put together and bring into the process to form what we would refer to perhaps as a learning journey that participants will go through as they're doing their learning, their deliberation and their making of their recommendations. And again, all of that then has an impact on the recommendations that emerge as a result of the process and your question, the evidence and the design really matter there. And you can, of course, have processes that enable you to delve into systematic issues and explore at all sorts of levels as we did in Scotland actually um, the levers and, and levels of change that are needed to tackle the climate emergency or you can again have those really like more focused on specific issue type approaches where you're really getting to grips and, and to the heart of maybe a particular issue and the final thing I'll just say is, is just a quick reflection on the mode of delivery um, I know myself and Kayla and others have delivered assemblies that have been entirely online entirely in person or some kind of mix and I just want to say that all of those options absolutely work you can have really good quality deliberation in all of those different modes of delivery and I think I think we've learned an enormous amount about online deliberation in the past couple of years and we've even got to the point where a, a global assembly process has been able to be delivered so yeah when it comes to modes of delivery um just want to say that you know i'm quite optimistic about the different chances we have to bring people together in different formats to talk about these quite important issues kayla okay so yes as <laughs> kelly said um yeah, we worked together on scotland's climate assembly and i've also been involved in a number of others i think um the point that Kelly was making there about the sort of the question, the question is really important and actually having that really clear task and each assembly has to be different depending on its context, but not only its context and its relationship to government, which I'll come back to, but also the stage of kind of policy and decision making that actually the assembly is taking part, taking place in. Now, a lot of, a lot of local council assemblies in the UK particularly, uh, assemblies have taken place quite early in a process, like there's been a sort of declaration of a climate emergency, and it really is the start of that process of, of helping um, citizens get engaged in, in setting a direction, a direction of travel for, um, for their local area and the types of things that are important to them. And I think one of the things that's interesting that the Devon Climate Assembly did slightly differently, and partly because it was initially planned to take place at a quite early stage like that and be an agenda setting type of model, but actually because of COVID and lockdown and, and delay, they decided to delay, a huge amount of other engagement work went on, went on across that area that really has set this sort of interim plan, I suppose, Devon Carbon Plan by the time that the assembly came together. So it had a very different question because actually it was about looking at three kind of outstanding thorny issues rather than trying to cover how do we, you know, how do we need to change the whole to tackle the climate um, emergency? So it really took a deep dive into sort of very specific thorny issues that, that hadn't been resolved or come to a sort of general consensus in this wider public consultation. And that, that enabled the, the partnership in that case, um, made a number of local councils to really start thinking, well, you know, we do have now a bit of a clear steer from that cross section of citizens to to sort of make decisions that we weren't quite so sure about yet, quite sure what the public reaction was going to be. And I think in that way, they can be really instrumental as well as setting that very big um, policy agenda. That's cool. probably enough for me to start. I mean, there's <laughs> lots of other things we could, I'm sure lots of other things we could both talk about, but whether we want to get into kind of questions and go that way. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for your inputs. Just before we open the Q&A and people can start thinking about the questions and putting them into the chat if, if they haven't already done so. Um, I was just a quick reaction to what you were both saying 
is it correctly understood that you think that so climate assembly is actually a pl pretty flexible concept, pretty flexible process that you could both have in different stages of the political cycle, and you could have uh, um, uh, both narrow and broad questions, so that you could actually um, imagine a lot of different processes with a, with different scopes and 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 uh, um, different lengths and, and different, a lot of stuff, or how do you see it? I, yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely the way I see it. I think while it's easy, to, in some ways it's easy to say, you know, it's gonna be a climate assembly setting climate change policy or agenda. It has to respond to the local context and it has to respond, in a, has to be set in a way that right from the outset, hopefully, there is a acknowledgement of how this is going to feed into policy, whether that's about one specific aspect of policy, be it transport or, you know, um, energy production, or or whether it's going to feed in a cross-cutting way, like the Scottish, um, yeah, Scotland's Climate Assembly did, was the full report to Parliament that cut across a huge range of policy areas, but there was an inbuilt way that that was going to be responded to by by ministers with the parliamentary debate and then the report back to the members. And the one thing actually I will mention about the Scotland's Climate Assembly is that actually the Climate Assembly had the opportunity to reconvene after the Scottish government's response was published. And that was part of the, the actual process of the assembly. And so formally recognised there that the government put their response of what we're going to do with the recommended, well, that what they're going to do with the recommendations that came from the assembly but then the assembly members came back together to basically consider whether they thought that was good enough and, and get that sort of back and forth dialogue going between government and the assembly members who'd taken quite a bit of ownership of, of their work by this point. Yeah, and I was delighted that, that that process happened at the end and is continuing actually, you know, stuff is still ongoing. And I think that's really important that, you know, that we consider what we do next and how we keep people involved and how we track what happens as a result of a climate assembly longer term. And again, I still think there's some learning to do in the area about how we track. Um, and I'm constantly looking for examples if anyone knows them uh, of how that's done well. But um, just in terms, again, you know, just reflecting on the flexibility, I just want to touch on what my starting point is for any of this really. And that's kind of sitting with the question around, you know, what is the problem we are trying to solve here? So a climate assembly typically, usually uh, should address some kind of complex problem that policymakers uh, maybe can't normally resolve through their usual means that maybe considers trade-offs or where there's dif difficult decisions to be made. You know, that's where they really work best. And when you start with that, question you know what's the problem we're trying to solve and don't jump immediately to methods sometimes you realize oh, actually it'd be better if we did engagement with the public or involve them in a different way and we use an assembly in another way um, so I think you know understanding why a climate assembly is needed and just set, sense checking that approach is a really good way to start and then you move on to your focus and having that clear focus and again you know we talked about you can have climate change and discuss that as one big huge topic uh, or you can have a more clear and defined focus how you get to that point um, and involve people maybe in setting questions matters, I think, because you might get to a point where actually the question you need to ask is different because you've involved this range of stakeholders in setting that question to just kind of sitting in a room and deciding that is the best question, if that makes sense. So that's always interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, lots of different ways to do this and it will work differently in different contexts. But I think there are just so many exciting examples that have emerged now that we can start sharing these case studies much more openly and sharing the learning and indeed I think there's more research being done alongside the processes and Scotland's Climate Assembly certainly a research team followed the whole process and will be publishing um, their results soon. Thank you and just uh, one quick follow-up so do you think it's do you think it's at all possible to say anything general of which context the Climate Assembly works better in or is it uh, is it starting with the question asking yourself so uh, what is controversial uh, what can't you uh, overcome by uh, or where do you need to involve people and, and get their reflections or how do you see it i think i'll just jump in and sort of build on on what kelly was saying there that i think the importance of 
a question that really is about a problem that politicians or officials themselves and alone can't solve. So, and and in so many different contexts, that's that will be different things depending on what stage of action and what stage of of current awareness and commitment to tackling sort of climate emergency there currently is in any area. But fundamentally, that there's no obvious answer, and that trade offs and change really has to be made that people might not be comfortable with. And I think that's where it can be really key. Yeah, and there's just two things that I'll add to that, which uh, may be a slightly different take. Um, so first, I think you've already alluded to this, but the timing in which you hold these processes really matters. There is no point doing a climate assembly that's going to lead to producing a range of actions after you've already published a climate action plan, for example. So you really need to think about the point, as you were saying earlier, in the policy process or in a process in which you're, you're having these. Um, and the second thing is that you can have the best process in the world with the most excellent question that gets to the heart of the issue. But at the start, you need to think about where these recommendations are going and feeding into and influencing and where responsibility for action and response lies. Um, and, you know, it depends sometimes on how these processes are set up. Sometimes they are set up um, off the back, perhaps, of uh, something that's gone through Parliament. They're built into legislation um, and things are going back for Parliament, you know, for, for scrutiny, essentially. Uh, in other cases, they're kind of coming off the back of, of individuals and teams who just want to kind of run a process um, and it plays out in different ways you know these these processes stem from different places and they're at the moment very dependent in the kind of context of the governance structure in which they're situated but yeah they've got multiple routes to to spring from cool thank you very much for those qualified answers and so jane have there been any questions in the chat so far Yes, they have. Thanks, Frederick. Um, yes, so the first question is um, about regulation. Um, the question is, what is the framework that regulates climate assemblies? Is it a national law? Is it regulated by some international agreement? If so, which? Um, and I suppose if a, a follow up to that is that um, if it's not, should it be? <laughs> uh, do you want me to... Uh, either Kelly or Kayla then uh, to answer that question please yeah I mean I can kick off I think it that question follows on from what I was just um, starting to say at the end there that the route for many of these processes uh, it depends on the context in which it's situated and you see different I think um, routes for these processes to emerge so in some cases yes it is part of legislation that has gone through parliament in other cases it's just the initiative or a team or a, a group of people um, who want this to happen I'm not aware of any um, international agreements really that, that guide any of this and I'm not aware of any intention to create that um, and I haven't really seen that if I'm honest as part of a a core debate or discussion around this but yeah I'd be really interested to be honest in hearing maybe other participants reflections in the chat about what they think but at the moment that doesn't seem to be on the on the table though we have seen some cases around law and there's National growing law. growing um kind of international what do I call it sort of development of what would, of standards of what would be expected of the climate assembly and they particularly associate with how members are recruited, the balance of evidence, but also very much that how it's embedded into a decision-making process, whatever that process might be. Because sometimes it doesn't have to be just government either, because actually, you know, um, some we've seen assemblies commissioned by, you know, sort of local development partnerships and things like this to, re to really bring the community into how they're going to take things forward for their area. So it's so contextual. But, it, but knowing what you're going to do with it, with the information before you start, is, is seems pretty vital. And if, if I should just add a, a quickly, um, I think I haven't heard about any, I mean, general regulations either. So it's very different from country to country. Uh, as you said, in some countries, it's a climate act that established the um citizens assembly in denmark it was a political agreement leading up to the climate act so it's not a part of legislation but it's a political agreement uh, uh, made by a broad coalition and in germany it was uh, initiated by a civil society organization so it's really different um how it's commissioned and and therefore what 
type of regulations there are for it. Um, but and and in relation to that, I just want to say that um, we have an ambition in Knaka to also um, create some guidelines for commissioners on on how to um, how to go about these type of processes. So Jane, thanks, Frederick. Um, so there's a uh, sort of connected to that. There's a couple of questions about how um, how uh, climate assemblies are commissioned. There's um, one uh, question about the frequency of climate assemblies. So are they sort of randomly summoned, or is there a kind of trend of um, uh, their sort of frequency, or um, is it based on political will? Um, sort of random political will or public demand. What can you say about that? Kayla? I think the answer that I would give is that at the moment it still is a bit random. There is no kind of, you know, formal structure that demands a sort of regularity or even a length or size, and that's where some of those emerging standards and sort of best practice models are coming out that are being shared internationally, but I I think, yeah, there, it's it is a bit random. Let's just own that. Actually, I mean, I'm oh, sorry. No, no, yeah, no, it's entirely it's it's entirely true. I agree. I do agree with Kayla. And um, you know, if you're interested in seeing some of the case examples, I think uh, people like the you know the, the team at the OECD have done a fantastic job of trying to collate some of the examples where things are happening, including um, documenting some of the places that are now trying to embed or move on from doing just kind of one-off ad hoc processes. Although they haven't necessarily been specifically about climate, it's more about the routine use of citizens' assemblies or indeed deliberation um, as part of the way that they maybe make policy or involve um, people in decision-making. And, you know, just off the top of my head, you might want to look at examples from Ostbelgian um, from I think from probably from Brussels, um, from uh, Vorlberg and uh, has been doing some quite interesting work, I think, and Ireland actually in the approach that Ireland's taking. But people are interpreting what it means to do this in a routine way and to embed this uh, in quite different ways. You know, again, there isn't just one approach that everyone seems to be taking. It, it's quite varied. But again, you, I think it's worth reading some case examples and drawing elements that might be relevant for your context. And it is that recognition that actually citizens' assemblies are being used across many of these countries on many, many different topics or policy areas. Um, climate assemblies have become very popular and being seen as quite an effective response to this sort of larger climate emergency that, again, just doesn't have an obvious answer and actually isn't just about sort of small areas and, and nations individually. So climate assemblies being picked up, but they're, you know, all sorts of topics being addressed through that deliberative processes. And also just adding to what Kelly said about the different interpretations of what routine means in, in this relation, um, there's also a, a big difference uh, from place to place in how competent the, the, the administration or uh, the political officials are in, in running uh, these type of processes. Some places, um, they, they've built up some type of experience and some places it's the first time that they're doing it. And so um, if you have a, an experienced uh, administration, it might also be more routinized in some way uh, than places where it's the first time that they have to do it. Thanks, Frederick. Um, so we've got um, another question about um, commissioning um, a climate assembly. Um, it's about um, the support and how they're commissioned. So would you have any advice for those who do not have upfront declaration of the authorities or politicians when preparing and organising an assembly? Could you share with us some examples of such assemblies and were they successful? Yeah, I know, Kayla, you, you were sharing something about community planning process earlier. And of course, civil society is having quite lively discussions about the use of assemblies. And I'm pretty sure some of the um, campaign groups and some of that kind of public messaging that's happened has influenced some public authorities' decisions to have assemblies. I mean, the, the, the current, um, I guess, 
evidence around this is showing that if you don't have that direct link to a space in which policy is made or to decision makers, um, then the question of influence and, and impact, I think, is interpreted in a, in a different way um, because you don't necessarily have that direct link or that opportunity to directly feed in to the places that may hold resources or responsibility for action. So then you can take, I guess, a civil society uh, out of a process like this and priorities to campaign around, take further action around um, and provide support perhaps across your community around. But in terms of the link to policy, and if you're thinking about impact in that way, um, I think the research is showing, and we, we've been looking at this in Scotland, we've been thinking through um, how you, we could, what we're calling institutionalised deliberative and participatory democracy, but that just means uh, use it in a more routine way. Um, that there are a few key things that make these processes kind of successful in terms of being able to demonstrate impact and they include things like um, having some of that political buy-in and that being cross-party you know there shouldn't be agendas that are held by one particular party um, opportunities to have broader input into a process is something that seems to be quite favored and I think there's really interesting ways you can work with civil society in order to do that um, but you know, having that really direct link, I would say, um, for any kind of deliberative mini public, you know, if they are to be permanent, being written into constitutions, into legislations, or the rules of specific institutions. So they have a point at which they land in those decision making spaces and have to be considered and responded to. Um, also, you know, has links to then ensuring that things like funding are perhaps available for follow up actions. And there's a bit more planning uh, in terms of kind of like you know the policy and, and all the strategies that we have there so yeah you can do them you can have impact it's just that what you get out of the end and the steps that you need to take differ depending on what your starting point in and the buy-in that you have from whatever site it is um, that might hold the power and resources to actually tackle the issue and take the next steps that's my view anyway <laughs> okay. and just uh, just to add to that i mean first of all asking whether a climate assembly is a success uh, depends on what type of aim it has, right? And then related to that, uh, climate assemblies could potentially play different type of roles. So it doesn't necessarily need to play a role in that it has a direct impact on legislation or on policy making in a parliament or in a government and stuff like that. Um, so you also asked for examples of climate assemblies that didn't necessarily uh, that hadn't necessarily been commissioned through legislation or stuff like that. And so, as I briefly mentioned, the, the German one was initiated by civil society and it didn't have uh, a, a direct link to, to the policy system. Um, but then in terms of, of discussing impact, you might want a climate assembly whose role it is to raise awareness, right? or um, start a discussion or um, multiple other types of, of roles in there. Uh, I think something that is pretty underdeveloped when we uh, talk about climate assemblies is communi communication strategies, outreach, stuff like that, where you could have climate assemblies. We have examples of climate assemblies that have fairly direct links to policy making, but they, they don't necessarily have great impact because the broader public doesn't know about it or uh, and therefore they can't discuss it right so they don't dis they don't take up the discussions of the climate assembly in a broader uh, context and that might be a, an, an important role for a climate assembly to play so i think uh, there are a lot of aspects that we could think about that that are still underdeveloped Thanks, Frederick. Um, there's a, another question about specific examples um, that that might be one for you, Frederick. Um, just to point people to our, our website. Um, but the, the question is, I'd be very interested in a specific example, who set it up, what kind of complex policy challenge needed to be tackled. Um, there is examples on um, our website of um, short summaries on our website. Do you want to say a bit more about that, Frederick? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, you can always go to a website and see uh, an outline of the different key features that I went through and then how 
uh, and then descriptions of the different national uh, climate assemblies to see what we mean um, um, more concretely in the different cases when we talk about uh, design and implementation and follow-up. So that's one way to go about. Um, but I think also the question, um, what kind of complex policy challenges needed to be tackled? Um, I don't know if you have any good inputs on this, Kelly, but but um, but I guess um, that's also sometimes in Knocker we also talk about that we need to engage the uh, climate policy actors more, and maybe they're actually better. So, as I said in the beginning, uh, we're practitioners, so we work with the process, but we might need to engage or raise the awareness of climate assemblies among policy actors more because they might be the ones uh, who need to have a discussion about what type of uh, policy challenges that we need to tackle and that we need to tackle in a democratic process like a climate assembly. I think that's some of my reflections at least. Kelly, did you have anything to add to that or? No, okay, thanks. Um, uh, Catherine has another question about um, how citizens, how could citizens be mobilized to participate? I'm not sure whether she means um, actual as members of the assembly or more kind of broadly in terms of the, the wider public um, engaging in the process um, in parallel to the actual assembly. Kayla, do you want to come in on that? Again, not knowing well, which part of the question, but I get in terms of people participating in the in the assembly themselves, becoming members. I think you know, as as Frederick was saying earlier, very much it's a re recruited model, less a sort of volunteer because you're necessarily interested in climate set, in climate challenge. So actually, in a lot of the um, assemblies, it is about making sure not just that your group is sort of demographically representative in terms of age, gender, location across the, the area, but also in views on climate change. And that actually, I think, could be really important in terms of its legitimacy, but also in terms of the way people perceive it and take it take an assembly's results or an assembly's conclusions to heart because they recognise there are people who may have started, at least, with views that were similar to theirs and quite wide-ranging, and it's not just the people that you, you know, that are already actively campaigning in these sorts of things. And one of the ways that people then get incentivized to take part is very often that kind of honorarium that acknowledges their time. Yeah, there's a there's a really practical point in what Kayla was saying there about trying to reduce the barriers to participation and the support that you give to people to enable them to participate and feel or, or build at least some confidence in order to do so, uh, I think is really, really important. And that kind of support structure that we've put around processes in the past, I think, has really ensured that people feel like they're able to continue through something that ends up sometimes being like seven, eight weekends of their time. And, you know, without that support, it's, it's a lot more difficult to participate. And I think, um, you know, the, the processes that we're talking about in some respect tend to be um, the people there are like recruited, like, you know, randomly selected. And there's a whole process that happens to reach out to the wide groups of people and to invite them to take part. And then some kind of selection that enables uh, you to kind of balance different demographics and perspectives. But that's not the only way I should say to involve people in an assembly process. It doesn't just have to be about that one group. You can do a whole range of kind of pre-engagement activities, for example, where you have loads of community dialogues. And in fact, you could use them to help frame the question or some of the challenges that an assembly would look at and I think that is still an area where there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of development you know I, I think I'd love to see more of that you also think about how you would involve different um, groups of people as part of the the learning or evidence journey you know inviting people along perhaps as informants to share their perspectives and their experiences 
from their communities, you know, people that might be um, kind of facing issues, you know, around climate change and feeling the, the brunt of that. Um, so you might also involve people in kind of reflecting on emerging recommendations as they're coming out and giving feedback in a slightly different way. So there are a lot of options for people to get involved potentially. And, you know, the way that you design a process will enable that or, or not. So I think it's worth thinking about that at really early stages of how you want to involve people. Uh, if you want to involve them in setting the agenda, if you want to be part of the process of scrutiny and perhaps mobilization and action afterwards. Um, but these processes, and this final thing we'll say, you know, really strive to involve people that aren't necessary advocates for one position or another. They really try and bring people who have a stake in all of these issues, which is literally everyone, uh, into the fold and, and give them the opportunity to participate too, even if, you know, two weeks before they never thought they'd be sitting in a room of uh, 100 people talking about the climate. And I think it's really important that we're thinking about, you know, the mobilisation and opportunity and multiple routes of participation for the widest amount of people. Thanks, Kelly. And just just okay. to add to that quickly, um, I think we haven't really seen this in, in the climate assemblies uh, so far, but in other type of deliberative processes we've seen, um, experiments with opening up the process during the process, right? So as Kelly says, you could involve more people in the agenda setting or in other steps of, of the process, but um, I've seen processes where they've used more design thinking methods, right? Prototyping so that people who are, who are selected to be part of the process um, um, develop their recommendations as prototypes that are then uh, put into a, a larger forum with with more people and so that the process is more open to people uh, outside and and that way you can involve and engage a larger group. I think that's also pretty interesting. Thanks thanks everyone. Um, just connected to the um, to the sort of idea of wider public engagement and awareness um, Carmel's asked what kind of PR do you propose to do before during and after the assembly? Kayla, do you want to reflect on that given your experience um, with involved? I think there's been lots of different approaches taken to that. I know Climate Assembly UK, while there was um, some announcements and things, actually it was very important that the assembly kind of happened slightly away from the public eye because they wanted to protect the, the assembly members from being, you know, lobbied, unduly influenced, things like this as well, and have that as a sort of focused process. But again, other assemblies have taken a very different um, track. The Scotland's Climate Assembly tried to keep a lot of social media engagement going throughout the um, throughout the whole process. Sessions were all live streamed. Um, there was opportunities to sort of review and look back at the videos. They were all published as well as we went along. So it was about engaging people with the topic and the conversation and being able to feed in. And I've just put in the chat that the Jersey Climate Assembly also had a, a very sort of significant pre-engagement phase that enabled people to really help set the agenda. I think one of the interesting things, and it's picked up there as well, that actually, um, and again, I'll refer back to the Devon Climate Assembly and how they took the recommendations that came out of the assembly and put them back into the wider public domain by actually producing a response that said, well, this, you know, this is what we're now proposing to put into the Devon Carbon Plan and do you, the wider public, in an open form of consultation, um, you know, agree that we have interpreted the intent and are implementing them the way that we should. So it opened that up to a much wider group to be able to sort of get involved and participate. Thank you. Um, Kelly, did you have any thoughts on PR? Um, not particularly beyond that some reflections that I've heard more recently from people involved in processes is that, that a media partnership from the very offset uh, is a good way to get the message out because it's quite difficult otherwise to get media engaged, especially as you're kind of uh, going through the process. So again, some early thoughts of media and perhaps a good partnership um, is one way to go. And I believe that's what happened with the UK Climate Assembly. Correct me if I'm wrong. Which it has was, a film. It does. And, you know, that sort of documentary things, like what is it? Um, People versus climate, which actually showed on the BBC, like it's a mainstream 
television documentary during um, during COPS. So things like that that kind of build that awareness are really important as well. But tell real stories of the people that were involved, not just the policy outcomes, because that's not always the, the exciting bit for, for a lot of people. So Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I think time is already uh, or almost up. So I just want to um, say thank you, James and Kelly and Kayla uh, for helping out. Um, and then uh, thank you for everybody who showed up and participated. I hope it was valuable um, and useful. And I hope you, that you want to sign up if you haven't done so and that you want to tune in on the next Knaka event. So uh, have a good day and thank you.